Hi, welcome to Resin Chem Tech. Today's video is based on a viewer request and is going to be a rapid fire round of the most commonly used components that I use in my projects. It won't be all inclusive for every project and it's not going to be a how to video. It's just to show you the components that I use and maybe you give you ideas for projects of your own. So let's get started. couple other quick notes before I start. Links to everything that I show will be available in the video description as long as links to a related blog article that will also have photos of everything that I show. I'm going to try to group components together, but just remember certain components may fit into more than one category. Here we go. Okay, nearly every project that I do has some kind of microcontroller or control board involved, and by far my most favorite one is the Wemos D1 Mini and ESP8266. If you need more GPIO pins, you can go with the full-size Node MCU. ESP8266. If you need more horsepower, you can move up to an ESP32 Mini, or once again, if you need more pins, the full-size ESP32. Now, for all of these, I like to usually mount these on something called Electro Cookie a Solderable Breadboard. The nice thing about these is they have traces, so they work like a breadboard, but give you the abilities to secure things by soldering components together. Now, some of your projects may require even more horsepower, in which case you can look at a Raspberry Pi 3 or 4. These are very hard to get at this point in time due to chip shortages. But if you do use a Raspberry Pi, you're also going to need a micro SD card. You're going to need a 5 volt, at least 2.5 to 3 amp power supply, and optionally, a case. For some projects, say like for LED lighting, you really don't want to build your own controller. Search around out there. Some people will build controllers for you. This is the Dig Quad uh, by Quindor. Those pretty much cover the most common microcontrollers that I use. Well, let's move on to LED strip lighting since I so many of my projects involve that. I like to use uh, BTF uh, LED strips. They are not a sponsor. They didn't provide anything for this, but I found they are always good quality. These come in all sorts of flavors and options. You can get them on a white background. You can get them on a black background. They come in one meter or five meter lengths, but you can cut them to any size that you like. They come in different pixel densities. This is 60 pixels per meter. You can get 30 as well, or you can get 144, and there are also other varieties in between there. These are RGB. If you want true white, you can move up to the SK6812, which includes a separate white chip. Uh, there's also these also come in a bullet pixel style, which I don't have any. They're all on my Christmas tree, but here's a picture of those. Or you can actually go with individual uh, RGB pixels and build your own. This is by no means all of the various options that you can get in terms of LED lights or LED pixels. These are the most common that I use in my projects. And for most of your LED projects, you're going to need other accessories as well. You're going to need to be able to connect your LED strips to your power and your data signal. And I like to use one of the most common are these JST connectors. Just make sure you get the right number of wires for the type of LED strip that you've got. If you don't like to solder or can't solder, you can also get these uh, snap-on connectors. They come in 45 degree angles, T and straight through. When it comes time to mount your LED strips, I love to use this aluminum LED channel. It comes with diffuser and you can get the diffuser in different shapes and even different colors. And you can get the channel in 45 degree angle as well. Now, regardless of whether I'm mounting my LEDs in this channel or just directly to the surface, I love to use this 3M double-sided tape. It is the same width as the LED strip. And so a lot of times I will even put this LED tape inside of the aluminum channel just to make sure that none of my LEDs come loose over time. Okay, you're also going to need to be able to power your LED strips and your controller. And it's going to depend upon how many LEDs you got in terms of requirements, but up to about 15 amps. I like to use these uh, what I call brick style power supplies. Anything above that, you're going to need what I call the transformer style. Just remember that with these transformer styles, you will need to buy a separate AC power cord as it doesn't come with one. Now, most of the power supplies, at least the good ones, come with over voltage and over temperature protection. But if you want to be extra cautious, you can get yourself an inline fuse holder, add a fuse to your project, uh, and an assortment of different fuses. And often I like to add a little uh, 1000 microfarad uh, capacitor to my power supply just to help to even out the power. Oftentimes when dealing with projects, you're going to have to convert your voltages. 
Here are some of the most common ones that I use. First off is a 3.3 to 5 volt bi-directional logic level shifter. Now, whether I need it or not, I include this with almost all my LED projects. Do note that this is meant just for a data signal, not for true voltage. Uh, Quindor also sells a uh, signal booster. There we go. That uh, will boost the signal and also allows you to do power injection. When looking at actually converting voltages for your project, this first one is a small little device that will take anywhere from 2.7 to 11.8 volts in and give you a constant 5 volt signal out. Another option, especially this is especially good for LED strips if you're using a 12 volt power supply for your LEDs, but you have a 5 volt controller and you don't like to solder, this will simply take 12 volts in and give you 5 volts out. You can even go with an option to power your 5 volt uh, device by AC power. This actually takes 120 volts AC in and gives you 5 volts DC out. Then you have variable options. So this uh, buck converter will actually take up to 24 volts in and can be adjusted anywhere from 3 volts to 6 volts, 9 volts, 12 volts out via a little tiny uh, set screw there. Or you can even go even bigger than that, and this particular converter will take anything up to 28 volts in, all the way down to 3.5 volts in, and give you anywhere between 1.25 and 26 volts out. And while there are many other options available for power conversion, always carefully check the specifications and make sure that whatever device you're using is also rated to handle the current or the amps that you plan to pass through. And here are some other common components that I sometimes use with LED projects or I've used them multiple times with other projects. First off is a PIR motion sensor. I like this particular one because it has a very short five second cool down reset time as opposed to some others. For distance, uh, ultrasonic uh, distance sensor. Or for a little more accuracy, a LiDAR uh, time of flight sensor. If I want to add remote control, uh, an IR receiver and an IR remote. Many, many of my projects, I use a normally open push button to turn things off and on. If I want to add sound reactivity or to record, I can add a microphone. If I want to have sound going out, say, for example, I want uh, sound effects or some kind of voice recording, it's a little uh, MP3 player that takes a micro SD card and one or more small uh, speakers. For something that requires clock or consistent time, this is a real-time clock module. It has battery backup. And if I actually want motion in my projects, I will tend to use servos. These little plastic ones, if it's very lightweight, I generally like to use these metal uh, servos. Have a little bit more power and less likely to strip the gears. And finally, I tend to use these 5-volt relays so I can trigger a 5-volt signal to turn a relay off and on uh, anywhere up to uh, 120 volts AC. And this by no means is the only components that I've ever used. I have other projects where I might have used a load cell or a rheostat, uh, but these are the components I tend to use most often and I've used in more than one project. Next, when it comes time to make electrical connections, I have a few of my favorites. First off are some of these little tiny three pin magnetic connectors, uh, pogo pins on one side, but they snap together really nice and you can get them in other configurations other than just three pin. Next up, can't beat a good set of spade and ring connectors uh, with a crimping tool. Along with that is also a good assortment of barrels and the crimping tool that goes with those. And finally, probably one of my favorite things to use for either temporary and sometimes permanent are Wago clips. If you're not familiar with these, these beat the heck out of the old wire nuts. And again, they are UL rated and you can get them in uh, two, three, six uh, connectors. But, you know, a simple lift up on the lever, slide your wire in, clamp it back down. Uh, these are, are really, really handy, again, for either temporary or permanent connections. And for situations where you might have multiple wires uh, running together visible like say between your LED controller and your LED strip. I love to use a little bit of these braided sleeve and again this comes in multiple sizes eighth inch, a quarter inch, uh, even up to three eighths inch depending on how many cables and the uh, gauge of your wire. If you take that and you take a little bit of shrink wrap tubing 
you can put a little bit of shrink wrap on the, each end of this braided cable and make yourself a nice neat cabling run. So when it comes to tools here are some of the ones I use most often. Obviously is my soldering iron. This is a relatively cheap one. I think I've paid between 20 and 25 bucks for it, but it has served me well and I've used it for over a couple of years now. I believe this particular model is discontinued, but I'll link to it and you can see similar, similar models to that. I do love to use my flux pen with a little no clean flux in there. I don't know if I can get this under the camera, but a good set of helping hands is almost a must for any soldering project. Things I also use all the time is a good set of tweezers, different sizes, different shapes, even got a spudger in there. And I also have a uh, disassembly kit that has a number of things, but most importantly, all kind of different bits, including Torx uh, bits and everything else. So I always am able to find the right bit for a particular project. Now that's by no means are all the tools, you know, you need good wire strippers and a lot of other things, but those are some of the ones that I use most often and I like the best. Oh, and I didn't want to forget, forget to mention a good multimeter. Uh, I happen to like this one because of the big display from my old man eyes. In fact, it has a nice backlight on it. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention a few of my favorite smart home products and the ones that I use most often. And this is because they can be either used locally out of the box or can be flashed with custom firmware. Uh, one of my favorite is the Sonoff S31. And again, this can easily be flashed with Tasmoda or ESP Home or other local software. Uh, the Shelly 1PM, again, comes with local control or again, can be very easily flashed. The Sonoff S31 Lite, which is just like this one, except it's a little bit cheaper because it doesn't have power monitoring. Now, if you are going to flash your own firmware, you do need a basically a USB to TTL flasher. This one happens to be an FT232. Also a CP2102. For me, they both work equally well, but you need to be able to connect these to your devices and to your computer to be able to flash custom firmware. Now, if you don't want to mess with flashing custom firmware and you either have a Zigbee hub or you have one of the new Amazon she shall not be named devices that have Zigbee built in, again, here is another Sonoff. It looks exactly like this one, but it uses Zigbee and operates locally on your network. And I have had pretty good luck with these Akara, uh, again, motion sensor and door and window sensors, which again are Zigbee. And something that gets used in almost every single project that I do is my Ender 3 Pro 3D printer. And with the 3D printer, it allows me to print a number of custom enclosures and brackets and braces and other custom components that would be nearly impossible to buy or purchase and it makes the projects much neater and much more customized. And for nearly all of my 3D printed projects, I use Hatchbox PLA filament. I've had really good luck with this filament. In fact, uh, I really haven't printed with anything other than PLA at this point, but I've had really good luck with Hatchbox. No, they have not sponsored this video. And while you might find this last one a little bit odd, it's a very important tool in my arsenal, and that is a good quality label printer. Before I got this, I found myself constantly buying new items that I already owned until I got myself organized. Now everything is labeled neatly and I can find it and I quit making purchases of things that I already own. And yes, just like Sheldon, even my label maker has a label. So there you have it. Those are the most commonly used components and tools that I use in my projects. It's by no means a complete list, but they are the things that I use most often. In the interest of making this a rapid fire round, hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Thanks for watching. I hope to see you soon.